I'm going to be talking about uh, a practical application of uh, AI, machine learning, and, um, and embedded uh, devices. Um, but I can't uh, help but uh, reflect on uh, the point made in the previous talk about uh, drones in Malawi um, and dealing and, and the challenge you've got in front of you. Um, Ten years ago, I uh, started uh, uh, the DIY drones uh, movement, the notion being that that, uh, you know, that the, the pace of innovation in embedded devices, basically spin-offs of smartphones, sensors and GPS and cameras and things like that, would allow us to come at aerospace through a very kind of a different way, a kind of a bottoms-up way rather than a top-down, you know, rather than taking pilots out of planes, put wings on smartphones. And uh, we put the letters DIY in front of drones, which at the time drones were considered million, billion dollar aerospace military devices. And we just said, well, why not just do a kind of a homebrew computing club approach? And we could make it ourselves. And we started with Lego, and, and then it went up and up, and et cetera. And today, um, the drones that are being used in Malawi and elsewhere um, use the very software um, and embedded processors that, uh, that we, uh, we built over those 10 years. And um, the main application for this is uh, turning out not just in Africa, but around the world, is measuring the planet um, with high resolution now because the planet's changing. And that the floods you see there, that's just a reflection of the stress on all sorts of infrastructure from climate change. Um, what we're seeing is that even here in the United States, um, the, uh, the, the weather's getting more extreme. The flood waters are getting higher. Um, the, the hurricanes are getting, are getting stronger, the, the, the wave surges, et cetera. And so all of the water infrastructure of the world, including the United States now, has to be remeasured. Are those dams high enough? Are the levees high enough? Are those waterways wide enough? They were built for one assumption about water and climate, and we're now entering a new era where those assumptions are all wrong. And we have to figure out whether they're going to stand up to an era of more extreme uh, weather. We're using drones for this because that you can fly so low and so cheaply that we can measure within, within centimeter, even millimeter um, resolution, the volumes and the, and, the, and the material properties of these, well, this water infrastructure to see whether it needs to be fixed or not. So what you're seeing there in, in, in Malawi, it seems, it might seem to you like a particularly African problem, but it's not, it's a global problem. And the ability to measure the planet so we can manage it is something that embedded devices and IoT is allowing on an economic scale that was never possible before. So that was, that was 10 years ago, and that was putting the letters DIY in front of drones. Now I'm gonna talk about doing the same thing with cars. So drones are, for lack of a, at first degree approximation, drones are a solved problem. You can now go to Walmart, you can buy one, it works great, done, it costs $500, $300, amazing. You know, now we can look at the data. Uh, Self-driving cars are not yet a solved problem. Um, not only are they not a solved problem on the roads, but I'm betting that most of you don't have one. And as a result, you read about AI and machine learning and all the kind of complexities of self-driving cars, but you don't have first-hand experience. Now, you can go online and you can try simulations, you can take classes, Udacity, Coursera, etc., but there's nothing like doing it. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how to do it, and then afterwards we're going to have a birds of the feather session where you can learn how to do it yourself. So one of the famous precepts in Silicon Valley is that the next big thing will look like a toy. Um, you know, video games created GPUs, created AI, et cetera. Um, you know, the first Apple looked like a toy compared to the mainframe. Um, and, you know, these, these drones started as toys and are now becoming, you know, the new satellites. So this is, so the fact that these things here look like toys should both excite you and that it's fun and easy to do, to, to do, but also not discourage you from thinking that that's not the seeds of the next big thing. What we started is, is again, we put the letters DIY in front of self-driving cars, except for self-driving cars was too long, so we just call them robocars. And um, we are just a hobby. We're just a community, just like the Homebrew Computing Club, but it's getting pretty big. Um, we have about 10,000 participants around the world, um, 40 or 50 different regional areas, and every weekend somewhere in the world, people are taking these kind of cars and racing them head to head, fully autonomous, to see how fast they can go and how well they can navigate. Um, 
This weekend, um, on Saturday, uh, in Oakland, we're going to have another, our quarterly race at Circuit Launch. Um, you go to DIYRoboCars.com and you'll see the, uh, the link to the, the meetup and you can sign up. Um, and it's moved from back in the old days when we were in a warehouse to now we're in um, a quite nice indoor facility with good lighting and carpet. And um, that last, week, uh, last, last quarter when we did this, we beat the fastest human. This time we've got a faster human. So we'll see, we'll see how, how we do, but um, that's how fast we're going. Well, you'll, you'll see in a moment, but you know, it basically involves some standard platforms. Um, one of them is uh, called Donkey Car, and you'll see uh, the session after this, you'll get a tutorial on that. This is end-to-end um, -end deep learning. It's using um, essentially behavioral cloning. Um, so behavioral cloning means that you drive it manually around the track, um, and it gets a correlation between what it sees and the inputs you've given it, and then it learns from that. You send it up to the AWS cloud, and it learns from that, and then it attempts to replicate that on its own. Um, they look like that. They're just like an RC car, but they've got a camera. They've got an embedded processor. And um, what we do here is we do the learning on the cloud, in the cloud, where we have a lot of compute power, and then we do the, then we run the model locally in an embedded device um, using TensorFlow, uh, Python and you know and Raspberry Pi in this in this instance. Um, sometimes we scale it up a little bit, and we can even take it out to sort of you know go kart level stuff. Um, this is um, this is a, a race um, at an actual race course. Um, what's funny about this particular one is that um, the uh, the guy there, the driver there, is a guy named Carl Bass. He was uh, the CEO of Autodesk. Uh, he and his sons made that electric car, and we decided to uh, to hijack it. And so we, we uh, got this big servo to, to move the, 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 uh, the steering wheel and um, instrumented it with a bunch of you know, GPS and cameras and things like that. And then uh, we gave him exactly one tool, one, 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 uh, one device, and that's the big red button. Um, that's all he could do. All he could do is ride, be a passenger in a self-driving car, and if things went horribly wrong, he could press the button. Um, now, this is a CEO of a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company. He's not wearing a helmet. We gave him a button that we'd actually never tried before. Um, and uh, the good news is that it didn't work well enough to get to the 50 mile an hour that we thought it would get to, so he's never really in, in, in huge danger. But um, let's just say that uh, next time we'll probably give him a helmet. Um, this is uh, uh, this, uh, this week um, at uh, AWS reInvent in Las Vegas. They are going to be, uh, they, uh, Amazon has released their own version of a DIY Robocar called uh, the uh, AWS Deep Racer. And they are using this to teach um, AI, machine learning, um, simulation, et cetera. They have a series of tracks and races, et cetera. They've even introduced a new version of the car that has LiDAR. Um, you can see that these things, uh, this one here is, 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 is running a LiDAR. And um, it's getting pretty serious. All the big tech companies are now embracing this as a great way to teach um, and to get hands-on experience. Um, this, is, um, this may actually be a video. Um, this is, uh, um, videos are not playing. Mr. AV guys, is there any way to push the button and make them play? Um, oh. Has this been turned into a PDF? Uh, it's on the YouTube video on the external monitor. Oh. OK. Is there an external monitor? Uh, it's back here. Oh, OK. <laughs> so everybody get up. And get, get. OK. Um, so uh, so um, um, sorry, none of these videos are going to play. But what you should imagine here is this thing going freaky fast. You can actually Google it. This thing's going freaky fast. It's like 20 meters per second, which is like I don't know, 25 miles, 30 miles per hour. It is um, localizing itself. It's got cones. That, that green, the green uh, blob in the top right-hand corner is the um, uh, is, is its sense of position using a particle filter. We have these various cones, and it basically looks at the cones, figures out where it is, goes fast on the straightaways, slow on the corners, um, and um, well, you're just going to have to come next Saturday and see it because it is incredibly fast. Um, and when, when you, what you'll see here is something you're not going to see in the self-driving cars in, of, the, of the big guys. What you're seeing here is racing. Now, the Waymos and the Cruises and the um, Zooks of the world are doing fantastic work, but they're doing it very slowly and very safely. And that's great, and that's appropriate. But the history of automotive innovation is racing. 
for Ford versus Ferrari, et cetera. You know, for 100 years, the automotive industry has learned how to go fast and suspension and motors and, and, you know, and chassis designs on the racetrack, and there was a lot of crashing, and that was great. And now with self-driving cars, it's the first time in automotive history that we have not used racing to innovate. And we haven't done it for a number of reasons. One of them is that, is that um, it's, these cars are expensive. These cars are, there's a PR nightmare if you crash. These cars are really designed not for performance, but for safety. And, um, and frankly, these, guys, these companies have more on their plate, just you know, kind of like you know, navigating the traffic of San Francisco than really working on this kind of performance element. So it's left to us uh, to do this. There is something called uh, Robo Race, which uses million dollar cars. Even today, that thing has not gone wheel to wheel. And we do it every weekend. Somewhere in the world, we're going wheel to wheel, racing at, at top speed. So why do we do this? And are we, you know, are we doing anything that a Waymo or a Cruise can't already do? And the answer is not, you know, technically, our sensors are not as good as theirs. Our code maybe is not as good as theirs. But we are, we are exploring a different dimension of innovation, which is aggressive driving. You know, racing is all about taking chances. And, you know, it might be that we discover some technique to be safer by being more aggressive. So when you're, when you're going down a road and there is a... Um, you know, a car stopped in front of you. There's really two approaches. One of them is to you, you can just go slowly enough and leave enough distance so you have time to stop. The other is you can be very nimble. And you can just nimbly know where you are, know where the gaps are, nimbly get around it. That's kind of a racing approach. And so we are exploring the aggressive, nimble, you know, early on looking risky, but maybe later on developing reflexes that the big companies aren't doing. Now, I can't tell you that we're going to, you know, win a Nobel Prize for this or even be used for this, but I can tell you that we're doing something that isn't being done elsewhere. And that's what's stimulating and interesting about it for the developers who are part of our community. I'm um, actually going to go back to this. You can just sort of see here that the, that the analogs are really quite, quite clear. We are using all the same techniques, but you know, rather than running you know, 200 simultaneous neural networks, we might be running one or two. Um, we're, not doing, we're not solving all the problems at the same time. But every problem you see out there in the real self-driving car world about lane keeping or obstacle detection or decision making is being played out at a smaller scale um, with the robocar races. Um, this is also, uh, you can start in simulation. Also, a, uh, um, uh, so this is the donkey card simulator. So what, like the AWS Deep Racer simulator, the donkey car simulator, you can actually try it out without even having a car but then, you know, once you do have a car, you just load the model onto the car and it should behave uh, this, the same. Oh, this one actually works. Um, there you can see the simulator uh, working. This is on, a, uh, on an outdoor track. And um, it's pretty cool. It's kind of, you know, photorealistic. And, um, you know, we have a number of tracks that represent the real tracks that we're using today. Um, let me move on. Um, so they come into a number of different types. And, you know, one of these should be interesting to everybody. Um, uh, I'm going to start with computer vision. It just so happens that the founder of the OpenMV project, Kwabana, is sitting right here. That's Kwabana. He's got something pretty cool in his bag, which he may or may not show you, about the next generation, which they just announced uh, today. But um, uh, computer vision is, the, is, is, is one way to get into this. This is, this is simply very easy to use built-in camera processor IDE that allows you to do things like identify lanes, um, uh, you know, I uh, identify uh, objects, segmentation analysis, even deep learning right now. Um, these, these, um, these, these cameras are like $60 for camera and processor. That thing by itself, a $60 little board about the size of your thumb, can control the whole car. And the ID is amazing, and the, and the, and the code's already written for you. So that's, we, we call that the kind of the, the entry point. And for, for kids, we have something called the minimum viable racer, which is basically just that camera on a $12 you know, car chassis you can get from Amazon, and that alone will navigate this course. Now, it won't win, but it can, it can follow the course. Um, then you can go to very extreme um, levels. Um, one of them is called Cone Slam, which uses a fisheye lens on top of the car, which looks at the ceiling. Now, indoors, it's a little cheaty because the ceiling has structure. It's got lights. 
And those lights have a distinctive pattern. And you can actually you know, recognize where you are on the track by looking at the pattern of lights. And that's called SLAM, simultaneous, simultaneous location and mapping. And so a single camera with a fisheye lens, processed with nothing, nothing more than a Raspberry Pi, can go, what well, can win these races. Uh, so you don't even need LIDAR in that instance. Then we go to the deep learning ones. Um, behavioral cloning, I've just told you about. That's when you drive it first and then it follows, and then you have reinforcement learning. That's where it has sort of you know, um, uh, punishments and rewards, and that's what the Deep Racer does. Um, this other uh, one over here is from the NVIDIA team. It's called um, Jet Racer. Um, Jet Racer uses um, uh, simple supervision. Uh, so with Jet Racer, that's using the new NVIDIA uh, Nano, uh, Jetson Nano, and with simple supervision, you just drive around um, the track, and you just, um, and it shows you a little display on a web browser, and you just click on where you think the car should go. Based on what can see, I'd go there, I'd steer over there, you know, I'd take a right here on this turn. You do that a few times around the track, it's now learned from that, and then it drives on its own. Um, uh, this one right here is um, using uh, the new uh, Intel RealSense um, sensors. This one's called the T265, and it's visual odometry. And this one uses a combination of inertial sensors and stereo vision to, do, to know where it is just with its eyes alone. So it basically can map its way around a 3D environment, can replicate that. Um, these, these sensors are, you know, visual odometry was a PhD five years ago, and now it's like 170 bucks, and it just works. All the compute is on board the device. You can plug it into Raspberry Pi, anything, and it just works. And then there's these little ones like this one. This one, I can't even actually remember the name of this one. It's adorable, it's a Kickstarter project. Does anyone remember the name of this one? Um, probably says it on somewhere. Um, this is a Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, and it just, it's, got, it's got its own little sort of Jupyter notebook and Wi-Fi, et cetera, and it'll navigate around a little Lego town, stop signs and turns and corners, et cetera. Super, super cool. Um, and these things are now just available online. Um, so that's, that, those are the kind of levels of entry points, and those are the different kinds of technologies that you're learning. So how are we doing? And the answer is um, we're doing pretty well. Uh, We've been doing this for about two years. We race, started by racing monthly, now we race quarterly. And what you can see here is the two different approaches, deep learning and computer vision. And then the orange line is the best human. Now, as you can see, um, uh, you know, deep learning and computer vision have been advancing at different paces. Initially, the computer vision, thanks to Kwabana and team, was very predictable, doing really well. The deep learning wasn't learning. So the, uh, the, the donkey car team got better at it. Uh, and uh, sped it up, and then it got ahead. Then the computer vision team figured out smarter ways to take advantage of the new power and the new, and the new cameras. They got better, and right now they're essentially head-to-head. -head. And you can see in the very last race, we realized we had a problem, which is that the um, orange line was not moving because we had actually only just you know, bought in a guy, just somebody we knew, back in the beginning, called that the day. So it was like, okay, before we say we're beating a faster human, we actually need to bring in a fast human. So um, uh, we, we, we found a guy who's pretty good at racing, a good fast car, and he brought the time down by about, uh, about uh, 20%. We're gonna bring him back this Saturday, and he's gonna bring it down further. We think the fastest human time is probably gonna be around, around you know, probably four and a half seconds. Um, and right now the cars are doing about six seconds. So that's kind of where we're at right now. That is blazingly fast. It's a, like keep the kids away from the track fast. Um, and that's not happening anywhere else um, in, in the world. So um, as a result, the community is growing. This is just the, this is just, you know, the, the, the community uh, coming to our events here in the Bay Area. But as I say, they are happening around the world. Um, it's just so cool that just today, in Las Vegas at the AWS event, which I'm not even including in this one, I think they've got 400 people participating in that one way or another. So between the Google, um, Google's doing it with their uh, Google I.O. Um, you know, conference, um, uh, NVIDIA is doing it right now, you're gonna see more um, coming up from them on the Jetson Nano platform. Amazon is doing it, Microsoft is just adding it as part of their AI platform. Here we are with ARM. And, um, and then you have other companies like Mapbox who are bringing the mapping layer. So suddenly everyone's realizing that real world robotics, real world deep learning is, a, is an engaging, fun way to learn these things can seem a little abstract otherwise. And because deep, you know, self-driving cars are such an exciting topic right now, it feels very relevant, not just in terms of being part of something, but maybe even building your skills for ultimate, uh, ultimate career in that area. So how is it possible 
that, you know, that we can just do this, that we can suddenly take something you've been reading about that costs millions of dollars and just do it for $400 or $90? And the answer is a bunch of technologies, many of which come from, come from ARM, have suddenly become available in the last few years. Um, you know, the power of an embedded you know, processor, um, a Raspberry Pi 4 or a Jetson Nano, um, all based on the ARM cores. These things, a Jetson, you know, a Jetson Nano is, is a CUDA core, 128, I think, CUDA cores, um, you know, for, I think it's like $199. Um, you know, Raspberry Pi is, you know, a four is like, it's like $50. These things were just unobtainium before, and now we can do deep learning. I mean, you know, I just told you about uh, OpenMV, which is doing deep learning um, on board for $60, including the camera. Um, the sensors, um, the fact that we can do visual odometry right now it, with, with a, um, uh, an Intel uh, Myriad 2 Movidius chip on board doing the, doing the processing for like 120 bucks. This LiDAR you see right here, $89. Um, this, the, you know, the Raspberry Pi Zero in here makes this whole thing cost, uh, I think it's like $120. Um, so this kind of stuff just would never be possible before. That's why we can call it DIY, because it's affordable. When it's affordable and easy to use, that means it's not limited to Silicon Valley engineers. That's why we spread it out. That's why we have a version for high school students. We have versions, we have great communities around the world. That's why we make it open source. So we have this ability to propagate the self-driving car revolution to everybody. So this is your only alternative. You want to do self-driving car racing? There, I think there are like three of these right here. These are called robo racers. Um, you can't have one. Um, as a matter of fact, um, most of the race, they actually put a, the, the top pops up and they actually put a driver in there. Um, so you might be able to watch it on, on, you know, on YouTube, um, but you can't participate. Or you can join us at the Birds of the Feather session after this, play with one of these, and uh, join us this Saturday or at some location near you and do real racing with real deep learning right now. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>